Welcome to the Insomnia Coach Podcast. My name is Martin Reed. I believe that nobody needs to live with chronic insomnia and that evidence-based cognitive and behavioral techniques can help you enjoy better sleep for the rest of your life. The content of this podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not medical advice and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure or prevent any disease, disorder or medical condition. It should never replace any advice given to you by your physician or any other licensed healthcare provider. Insomnia Coach LLC offers coaching services only and does not provide therapy, counselling, medical advice or medical treatment. The statements and opinions expressed by guests are their own and are not necessarily endorsed by Insomnia Coach LLC. All content is provided as is and without warranties, either express or implied. When COVID led to Jake having to work from home, he found himself working way beyond the usual 9 to 5. Jake found himself answering calls and texts at all hours of the day, and he even started to take his computer to bed. Work soon encroached into his weekends, and before long, Jake found that he no longer had any kind of sleep schedule. When he took a vacation, he found it really hard to get any sleep at all, and this led to a lot of sleep-related research, a lot of anxiety, and a lot of worry. Fortunately, Jake's sleep recovered, but only for a few weeks. Then, his insomnia returned and was even worse than before. Jake thought that his sleep was broken and that something was wrong with him. The good news is, there's no real mystery when it comes to insomnia. From person to person, insomnia is remarkably similar. It's often our relationship with our thoughts and the behaviours we might implement in a bid to improve our sleep that provide insomnia with the oxygen it needs to survive. As Jake learned more about sleep and insomnia, he implemented evidence-based techniques to help build sleep drive, strengthen his body clock and weaken arousal. He started to spend less time in bed. He got out of bed during the night if being in bed didn't feel good. And perhaps most importantly of all, he tried to live the kind of life he wanted to live during the day, independently of how he slept. Now, Jake's life doesn't revolve around sleep, and he no longer tries to control sleep or put effort into sleep. As a result, he is sleeping a lot better and has regained confidence in his natural ability to sleep. A full transcript of this podcast and an accompanying video can be found at insomniacoach.com forward slash podcast. Hi, Jake. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to come onto the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Martin. Very happy to be here today. It's great to have you on. Um, let's start right at the beginning. Um, when did your sleep problems first begin? And what do you think caused your initial issues with sleep? Well, so we've all been going through this pandemic for the past well, almost, I think it's over a year now since it's hit the States. And um, yeah, I, I was doing pretty good with uh, with work and everything like that, working um, at an actual physical location. And um, once the pandemic hit, you know, I think it was like in, in March of last year, um, I was, you know, told to go home and I actually just started the job probably three weeks prior to that. So um, I had never really worked from home before. And it's something I just, you know, I've never really had to do. So I didn't mm-hmm. really know. I, at first, I didn't really have the discipline, you know what I mean, of working right. just nine, nine to five, like my old job was. Um, so kind of got caught in, uh, I want to say, uh, probably bad sleep habits. This is mm-hmm. what really first started happening to me. I was, you know, going to bed late because I would, you know, take work with me and all these, these uh, you know, I'd take the computer with me into bed, which is a big no, no. Um, I was, answering phone calls or text messages at you know, all hours of the day. So basically my nine to five turned into uh, when I wake up, I start working until I go to sleep and kind of in between intermittently. Mm. So um, I was good for, for probably a few months and I was doing this you know, working whenever. And um, unfortunately though, it started to bleed into my weekends. So, so working 
from home ended up being on my weekends and I was trying to relax. I, I didn't really have the downtime that you usually have from just a nine to five Monday through Friday. So uh, I, I just started working a lot. Uh, and I think what happened was I was getting stressed out from work. Um, nothing, you know, it's not, I don't blame anyone but myself on this one because it was just me not having that discipline of, you know what, if I get a text message or if I get an email after work, um, work hours or whatever, I should just let it go and get to it in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just, I wasn't, I didn't have that discipline and I wasn't getting up early and I would sleep in longer and longer until before you know it, my whole internal clock was off and I I ended up going on a, a vacation. Um, I live in the Northeast. So we went up to Maine for the weekend. I went with my fiance and we stayed in a hotel room, you know, and I guess I, what threw me off was I was getting, you know, work text messages and all this stuff on, you know, Friday night into Saturday. And I was like, oh man, I, I, I told everyone I was going on vacation for the weekend, <laughs> but um, that ended up throwing it, throwing me off a little bit. And I didn't think anything of it, but for some reason uh, that Friday or yeah, it was that Friday night. I didn't sleep at all. When I got to the hotel, I didn't, I slept like probably, well, I can't say I didn't sleep at all, but I probably slept like two hours. And I thought, you know, well, that, that wasn't fun. You know, hopefully I'll be good for the, the whole day and I'm on vacation. So I, I want to really enjoy this weekend. And then it went to uh, that next night. We went to that next night. And again, I slept like two or three hours and it mm-hmm. was, I was like, what is going on? You know, this is, this has never happened before. So I started to, you know, think about it more than usual. You know, I've had like anyone a bad night's sleep and um you know I I was even in the military and I used to do 24-hour shifts and stuff like that and never never thought twice about you know having difficulty sleeping Mm -hmm. um but now it's just like I don't know I I I freaked out a little bit I started you know researching things I was like how come I've had a couple bad nights sleep and I I just didn't really identify that it was maybe me being you know stressed with work and uh, being just, you know, in a situation where it's, there's just a lot going on in the world. There's a lot of anxiety right now. It's still, we're, we're still living it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it ended up snowballing into something that was pretty crazy. And um, I ended up having uh, like a week's night or a week of bad sleep after that. And it was just, I was freaking out. So yeah, <laughs> I went on, I went on YouTube. I went on, I was Googling all these th- things and and how to sleep better and how to fix you know sleep problems and it ended up being really uh it became very very stressful and it it was something i I, like i said martin i've never worried about sleep ever in my life i I love sleeping i used to Mm -hmm. be you know i'd consider myself a good sleeper again but i was a very you know very distraught i I didn't know what was going on so and a a lot of the stuff that i found online would freak me out it'd say you know if you don't get good sleep, you're going to have higher risk of cancer, higher risk of cardiovascular disease and all this stuff. So I started becoming like a little bit of a hypochondriac as well. And it just really blew out of proportion. And um, I was basically keeping myself awake and I was feeding the insomnia, um, you know, with, with all these thoughts and ideas and what ifs. Yeah. um, But that's kind of where it all went downhill and uh, it stayed that way for a while. Mm-hmm. So when, when you first had those really difficult nights when you were away on vacation, did did it seem obvious to you why those hard nights were happening? So, for example, you like kind of getting into bed and then just finding your mind was freaking out about work or something like that? Or was it just you couldn't come up with any explanation? You were just finding it really hard to sleep whilst you were away? It was, it was like a little bit of both. It was a little bit like I think it was because I was stressed out that I wasn't able to sleep, but it was kind of like, all right, enough's enough. How come my mind isn't shutting off? You know what I mean? I, yeah. I wasn't really able to come come down from all this anxiety. And then before you know it, I feel like the anxiety of like, work and all this other stuff, it, it almost like transformed into, um, I don't know if that's the word, but it turned into basically this worry about sleep. Mm-hmm. And then I, I really didn't worry about all the other stuff anymore. I was kind of like, you know, I'll get to that when I get to that. I'm worried about what's going on now. And, and it was just feeding it. It was just, it was a vicious cycle, like a you know, dog chasing its tail. I don't really know how to explain yeah. it. It was just, I could not get out of it. So yeah. and it, it got really scary. So, <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people identify with that, you know, like the like the dog chasing its tail, because as soon as we start to worry about sleep, that does tend to unfortunately make sleep more difficult and then sleep becomes more difficult. So then we quite naturally worry even more about sleep and it just becomes this vicious cycle that can just you can just feel so trapped in and it, it, oh, it just sure. seems like there's no way out. 
Yeah. And I think uh, another thing is the harder I tried to sleep, the further it got away. You yeah. know, I could, I couldn't get to sleep because I was trying so hard to sleep. It became, uh, I'd be awake, you know, all day and, and try not to take any, any naps just in case, you know, so mm-hmm. I could make sure that the night was good. You know, it was difficult. I couldn't even really take naps either because I was so worried. I was just so uh, anxiety ridden, I guess you could say. And I just really, I'd never really experienced that. So it was, it was quite bizarre. Yeah. Quite bizarre. So when you returned home from the trip, um, what was your sleep looking like at that point? Like, wh- how, how would you describe a typical night at that point? Um, yeah. So a typical night was, I'd worry all day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then getting home, it was just, it, it, that night I got back from the trip, it wasn't, it wasn't a good night's sleep. It was uh, me worrying about, hey, will I get a good night's sleep tonight? And then I think that was really the first night where I just really started to worry about the sleep and kind of forgot about everything else. And um, I would go to bed and then just lay there. And I think what ended up happening was, and I'll get more on this subject later, but I would end up going to sleep earlier than I used to, mm-hmm. where I would try to go to, you know, I'd be, I'd be in bed earlier and I'd try to sleep earlier. So, it, and that would just in turn make it harder. So I would lay in bed, um, like I said, I think nine hours mm-hmm. and I'd usually sleep, you know, about seven to eight. That was my normal kind of sleep cycle. And I was just trying to catch up on the sleep. Like hopefully it will just happen if I just lay here long enough mm-hmm. and it ended up just being, you know, even worse. I think it honestly exacerbated it and made it so much worse than it was, was me trying to lay in bed. And I was only getting, you know, three or four hours. Those was first uh, few nights being home. And it was just, it was rough yeah. until I did eventually end up having um, normal sleep. And I don't know if something came up or whatever, but I kind of like forgot about, um, you know, all these issues with sleep. Oh, I didn't forget about it, but it was like less and less. And then I felt better. I was, I think it just took one good night of sleep where I slept like nine hours or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then once I got that nine hours, I was like, boom, I'm reset. I'm good. No issues. There's nothing wrong with me. And I was good for about two weeks. And then I, or I think it might've been three. So I was good for two or three weeks. And then before you know it, boom, I had a bad night. And then that bad night turned into more bad nights. And then it was worse than before. It was like three or four weeks. And then I, it was just terrible. And it was yeah. um, most nights I was struggling to fall asleep. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd have that occasional night where I, I got a good night's sleep, but it, for me, it was mostly, I could not for the life of me fall asleep because my mind was racing. I was, I was wired and I, I just couldn't, couldn't slow down and relax. And it was, it was bad. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people listening to this are going to identify with every now and then you seem to get that good night. It might not be fantastic or it might be, but you yeah. tend to get like that, those, these odd nights that are actually pretty good. And you think, I've had, why are these not happening every single night? Um, but, you know, the, the typical explanation, um, there's no real mystery to it. Um, most sleep disruption is happening or is being sustained because of the arousal system. You know, we're like more worried about sleep or we're paying a lot of attention to sleep, maybe putting a lot of effort into sleep, trying, striving. Um, and this makes sleep more difficult. So we get less sleep. But when we get less sleep, our sleep pressure, that drive to sleep, you know, the body wants to sleep, that urge to sleep becomes stronger and stronger. And so we can't go indefinitely with no sleep, for example, sleep will always happen in the end. So when we have those better nights, it's because our sleep drive has just reached this tipping point where it's so strong, it's overpowering all that arousal, all that anxiety, all that worry, all that effort, all that striving. So sleep happens. But unfortunately, then you're kind of back at square one because now that sleep drive has been relieved. So your arousal system is back in charge and it kind of puts you back on onto that cycle of sleep difficulties again. Right. And so this is why we really want to take a two pronged approach. And by building that sleep drive, spending a little bit less time in bed or just an amount of time that's more appropriate to the kind of sleep you're getting, whilst also seeing what we can do to weaken that arousal system so we don't need to be awake for quite so long in order to get those better nights of sleep of course no i agree with you because it's after a while your body just you have to sleep like you're not gonna you know it it just the sleep drive really does kick in so yeah and i think in a way it can be a little bit reassuring because it shows that 
you can still sleep. You can still get those nights of a few, a few hours plus of sleep. So if nothing else that shows that your sleep drive system is working, your sleep isn't completely broken, that you are capable of sleep and you've got something to build on, something to work on. Um, so if nothing else, I think those one-off better nights can serve as a little bit of reassurance perhaps. Oh, for sure. For sure. And that's something that like, I really, I started to notice was uh, eventually, like at first I thought my sleep was broken. Like I do I have an issue. Is there something wrong with me? I mean, it's, and it was, for me, it was very anxiety based. So um, it was basically me, my mind, keeping myself awake. And then my body was just always tense and I, I wasn't relaxing at all. And, and yeah. I just really couldn't get there until eventually I feel like I just wore out completely, it just burnt out. And then my body would just, whatever, you know, head hits the pillow, you're out. And then that would happen. And that would be awesome. Cause I was like, wow, that really helps with my you know, sleep confidence. And, um, yeah, that, that was, that was really cool to experience that. And then, um, that's when I did end up finding your videos on YouTube and ended up finding, you know, learning more about CBT and CBTI. Uh, and I really think that that's, that's huge. So that's with the whole sleep restriction and all that, um, that was very good, but I don't know if I'm skipping ahead, Martin. So. No, no, that's great. I think that's a, that's a great point to move on to that. So like you said, you, you came across my YouTube channel, um, for anyone that's not not familiar with it, you can find it at youtube.com forward slash insomnia coach. Um, and really it's, it's these sleep related thoughts that we can develop and these sleep related behaviors we implement in response to difficult nights of sleep, you know, through no fault of our own, because we, we want to fix the problem of disrupted sleep. Um, but unfortunately, they can perpetuate that sleep disruption. So in order to get our sleep back on track, really what we want to do is address those thoughts and behaviors. And if we can do that, we create better conditions for sleep. And we do that through building sleep drive, um, strengthening our body clock and our good friend, the arousal system. We lower or we weaken that arousal. Um, so can you tell us a bit more about any of the thoughts? You know, you mentioned that that kind of anxiety. Um, can you tell us a bit more about any of the thoughts that you perhaps identified that could have been fueling your insomnia? Or maybe you touch upon one of them, spending a lot of time in bed, any of the sleep-related behaviors you were implementing in a bid to improve your sleep that on reflection might not have been that helpful. Yeah, so it, it really was a lot of those thoughts of, will I be able to get sleep tonight? how I function tomorrow um, is, and then there is also the, is there something wrong with me? I mean, is, is there something going wrong? And then that's when a lot of it was, I was Googling a lot of stuff. I was watching a lot of videos because I'm a big YouTube person. I, I love watching videos. I think it's great. Uh, and I get a lot more insight than just watching or reading something on Reddit or whatever. But uh, yeah, it was just a lot of, a lot of, worry and and then you'd, you'd see something or read something where someone's like i haven't slept in a few days and then before mm -hmm. you know it, you're like is that going to be me am i going to be this person who's up not being able to sleep and then basically being bedridden and it was it was just a lot of bad like negative sleep thoughts yeah and that was feeding it was it's just if you're thinking negative all the time about something it's probably not going to work out it's not going to be a positive outcome. I never thought this would happen to me. So that's why I was like, what is going on? You know, I, I never right. thought, you know, that I would basically not, not like lose control of my sleep, but kind of lose the confidence in my ability to mm. have a good restful slumber. You know what I mean? So it was, yeah. it was, it was bad for a while, but that's when I found, found you. And then I watched a lot of your videos. I researched a lot of my own read articles about CBTI and it's just, that was where things started to turn around significantly and pretty quickly. And yeah. I was very surprised. So I think the, the first thing that you, you did was reduce the amount of time you were rotting for sleep. Is that right? Yes. Yep. So instead of going to bed early and then trying, you know, allotting nine hours in, in bed, trying to sleep, physically trying to sleep. Yeah. Um, and, and before I get into that, I did try all the sleep hygiene stuff didn't work for me. Right. I mean, some things like, I guess, but that became kind of ritualistic. Mm -hmm. Um, and then before you know it, like you have to have tea at night and do a, you know, a certain meditation and listen to this tape and that tape. Anyways, that didn't really work for me. And it became more of uh, a hassle and yeah. it became more, gave me even more anxiety about trying to sleep. Cause if I didn't do one thing, I wouldn't be able to, to get that sleep, but the CBTI is what really worked. And it was that sleep restriction, which I tried first. 
And instead of going to bed, I think it was like 11 o'clock, like trying to sleep. I stayed up until I think one, one thirty, And I actually started to feel sleepy naturally. Mm. Like I used to, you know what I mean? So yeah. it was kind of letting go of trying to fall asleep at 11 o'clock exactly. And all this other stuff and staying in bed so long that I would go to bed and I would wake up within, I think it was a six and a half hour time frame, mm-hmm. And then I, I, I was able to sleep and I slept six and a half hours, but it did become um, clear that it, it, if I just got out of bed and didn't sit there all day, I was able to start my day sooner. I was able to do all these normal things, um, have breakfast, have, have tea in the morning or whatever. I usually do tea cause I'm not really big into coffee, but um, yeah, I, I just felt like I was able to have a full day and then at the end of the day, get naturally tired and, and I mean, naturally sleepy and go to bed. Um, but yeah, it took me a, probably a few nights of just trying the, the sleep restriction until it eventually felt like I was in a groove, like at a rhythm, almost like my circadian rhythm reset and it knew when to go to bed and when to wake up. Yeah. And it, it was less, less effort. So yeah. that, that helped tremendously sleep restriction. Yeah, I think that you touched upon it is that getting that sense of really strong sleepiness back again, because it's so easy to forget it, that that sense of sleepiness, because when we have insomnia, it's often replaced by this sense of fatigue, you know, feeling worn out, just exhausted and run down. And that doesn't feel good, obviously, but it's not a sign that we need sleep at that time. Um, Exactly there is a difference between fatigue and sleepiness. And what can happen is when we go to bed, when we're fatigued instead of sleepy, we're probably not going to fall asleep. And then because we're not falling asleep, then we start to get all those worries. Why am I not falling asleep? I'm exhausted. I'm so worn out. I can barely concentrate. Why am I not sleeping? Well, the reason you're not sleeping is probably because you're not sleepy enough for sleep. And then because that arousal is kicking in and This is through no fault of our own because everything we're doing is completely understandable. We want to fix the problem of this sleep disruption. But unfortunately, sleep is that is that oddity because it responds poorly to effort and striving. It's one of these things that gets worse the more we want it. Um, So by doing things like giving ourselves less opportunity for sleep, but still giving ourselves a good opportunity for sleep. Like I never recommend spending less time in bed than you typically spend asleep. So we're still giving you that opportunity for sleep. But by doing that, we're really building that sleep drive. Um, We are getting that sense of sleepiness back. We're creating better conditions for sleep. Um, And just as you found, it can just be, it can just feel so good to get that sense of sleepiness back. And that does help with sleep onset and it does help weaken or lower that arousal too. Oh, for sure. And, and I also noticed too, is uh, if I actually, you know, waited to feel sleepy because I, I would, you know, feel tired. Oh, I'm tired. I'm tired. I, I, I need to go to bed. I need to sleep. You know what I mean? But I wasn't really sleepy yet. So it was just, like you said, your mind keeps going. It's like, why am I not asleep yet? Why am I not asleep yet? But the sleepiness, once I started feeling that again, I also started to care a little bit less and less each night mm. about if I was going to get good you know, sleep or whatever. Cause it was honestly like the more sleepy I was, the less time I had to think about it, you know, it was less, yeah. less powerful. It got, um, I also had better quality of sleep instead of waking up multiple times in the night, like I did before. And this is something I want to, you know, touch on before is I did wake up, you know, it was hard for me to fall asleep, but I also did wake up multiple times throughout the night. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty bad at first, but, um, I do want to touch real, real quick on that other technique that I did use when I had, these troubles when I woke up and couldn't fall back asleep was I would get up and do something kind of, you know, boring or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. whether it's color in a coloring book or or read a book or just in, you know, a a dim light, quiet area. And that was just like my reset. So I I would, I would do that as well. That was another technique. Um, One thing I did just want to talk about quickly, just with that, with the sleep restriction and, you know, allotting less time for sleep, just waiting for that strong sense of sleepiness to occur is, Another reason why I think it can be helpful is it shifts attention away from the clock as well, because often when we're allotting so much time for sleep, like you touched upon, it was probably closer to nine hours and you were getting nowhere near that amount of sleep is often you can have this idea, okay, it's 10 o'clock. Now I have to go to bed Um, or 11 o'clock. I have to go to bed without any consideration of how sleepy you are because you're so keen 
to get a certain amount of sleep. You want to give yourself that opportunity. But the problem is the clock doesn't know when we're sleepy. Um, so if we go to bed based on what the clock is telling us, that could lead to some sleep disruption because we might not be sleepy enough for sleep. And also if we if we get really r- ritualistic about it's X o'clock, so now I must go to bed, it can kind of leak into our lives as well because then we might not want to, for example, go out for dinner or go out to the movies or socialize with friends because we feel that we have to be back for that set bedtime. And so I just think it's really helpful to not only a lot a more appropriate amount of time for sleep but to really try and shift attention away from using the clock as your guide for when to go to bed Um, yes maybe it can be helpful to have an earliest possible bedtime so if you're implementing a sleep window um, you could say i'm not going to go to bed before i think you said for you it was like one o'clock in the morning right but even then if one o'clock in the morning rolls around and you don't feel sleepy enough for sleep it can still be helpful to just wait for those natural sleepiness cues to appear before going to bed. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It it was just like night and day. Honestly, it was such a a big change instead of trying to go to sleep. Cause like you said, if you, you know, the clock doesn't know when you're sleepy. And another thing is clock watching too. That was, that would keep me up at the beginning was I'd look at the clock, look at the clock What time, you know, Oh my God, it's, it's two in the morning. I'm still awake. What's going on. But that was all that sleep effort. I was trying to sleep. I was trying to, to, to get to bed, at a certain time and stay asleep for a certain amount of time and hopefully not wake up. And it was just adding more and more anxiety, but having that sleep restriction and just staying up, like say I stay up and I I read until one o'clock. If I feel sleepy at one o'clock, I go to bed at one Mm o'clock and then I'll wake up, you know, six 30, seven o'clock, whatever it may be. Um, And it would just get better and better. And the quality of sleep would get better and better because after a while it didn't seem you know, eight hours sounds good, but I mean, who really gets a straight eight hours of sleep? Right. I mean, it's, it seems very, very hard, the older you get, especially. Um, but the quality, I rather have six and a half or six to six and a half hours of quality sleep instead of just sleeping, you know, trying to sleep for eight, nine hours, waking up, going back to sleep and having to do all these things. You know, I mean, it, the sleep restriction was huge for me and that really built up that, that sleep confidence again. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, if I did have bad nights, I would implement, uh, getting up out of bed and then doing something relaxing, going back to bed and usually I'd be successful in falling asleep. So that worked as well. It was my reset. Yeah. So. So let's talk about that because I think it can be really helpful to, okay, so we've got a plan in place right now. I'm not going to go to bed before a certain time. Um, I'm going to get out of bed no matter what at a certain time in the morning. So another good plan to have, you know, in the toolbox is what to do if you get into bed and then you find it hard to fall asleep or if you wake up during the night and find it hard to fall back to sleep. And often I I, I like to say that, you know, if being awake in bed feels good, there's no reason to do anything because it means conditions are right for sleep. But if being in bed doesn't feel good, then it can be a good idea to get out of bed and do something that would make that wakefulness a little bit more pleasant compared to staying in bed when being in bed doesn't feel good. And it sounds like that was a technique that you implemented. Um, So yeah, I'm really keen to hear more about how you implemented it and how you feel it worked for you. Yeah. So at first I was nervous at trying that. Uh, I was kind of afraid to get out of bed. You know, I was like, oh, well, what if I get out of bed and then I'm not as sleepy when I come back? That wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. Um, The first time I actually tried it, uh, it did work. And I was very surprised. So I got out of bed. I think I must have woken up maybe three in the morning. And I was like, oh man, I'm up at three in the morning. I really want to sleep. You know, I really want to get to bed. And then it's just um, one extra thing you have to do, but it, it works. You know, for some people it might not work, but maybe staying in bed works. Like you were saying, if the conditions are right for sleep, mm-hmm. but if I'm feeling wide awake, I'm not going to sit there anymore. So what I do is I'll get up. I have an adult coloring book or whatever. I'll color in that um, in low light. I have actually, I have um one of those Himalayan salt lamps that I just, mm-hmm. you know, I have, and I'll, I'll turn that on and I'll just, even if I sit up in bed, that has worked for me, but usually the couch is the best for me. Um, if I go up to the living room, it's a different room. I kind of can get that sense of being able to reset my mind, uh, do whether it's breathing techniques that helps too. I can even do a quick meditation if I don't feel like coloring or reading a book that late. Um, but it, it, it's just, it helps for, you know, 20 minutes is kind of like my perfect thing. I don't look at the clock or anything. I just kind of guesstimate 
Uh, if, it's, if it feels like it's been 20 minutes, I'm starting to feel sleepy again, which I usually do. Um, I'll head back to bed. And usually what happens is within a couple of minutes, I'm asleep. So it's kind of the, the head hits the pillow, but it, it's a good way to kind of get out of bed, kind of get back to like kind of a, a reality, I guess. You know what I mean? Instead of being in this anxious state of not being able to sleep, you're able to get back to a sense of, you know, I'm here, I'm doing, I'm all right. Yeah. I can breathe. And if, and if for whatever reason, um, it takes longer and you got to do it again. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. Eventually you will sleep. I think the the phrase you use, it helps me reset my mind um, was something that I just picked up on because often when we spend time awake in bed, that's when we start to ruminate, you know, the mind starts to fire up, get maybe notch up into a higher gear. And, you know, we're in bed, it's probably dark. Um, we're alone with our thoughts. It can be hard to kind of move away from that when the mind decides it wants to go into hyperdrive. And so getting out of bed and just doing anything else can act a little bit just like a, like a circuit breaker, you know, like a reset switch um, and help, help calm the mind a little bit more quickly compared to if you had have just stayed in bed um, with nothing else to focus on other than those thoughts. Right. And it kind of breaks that frustration of, you know, because after a while you end up going from anxious to frustrated to, oh man, I'm not going to sleep. Tomorrow's ruined, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then you start really feeding those anxious and uh, negative sleep thoughts. So uh, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, very helpful to just get out, reset, breathe. Everything's going to be fine and, and just have some sense of optimism. That's really what was yeah. able to help too. So um, that did work for me. And these are all, you know, tools that I can still use. You know I mean? If, yeah. if I have bad nights now, I mean, I, I'm doing a lot better. You know, I, I'm basically back to before this was happening, mm -hmm. so, but sometimes I do have those thoughts here and there. Oh man, you know, if something big's coming up, yeah. but um, yeah, it was just, that, that was very helpful in those techniques. Yeah. And I think one, uh, something else that can be helpful to recognize as well is it, you might not fall right back to sleep just because you got out of bed. Um, even if you get in and out of bed a few times during the night, you might not fall back to sleep. Um, because we can't control sleep, you know, our goal isn't necessarily to do something or to make ourselves fall back to sleep. Really what we're doing is just trying to give you an alternative to staying in bed if being in bed is just not proving to be helpful. Um, so getting out of bed, doing something else, if nothing else, it will probably make that wakefulness a little bit more appealing compared to staying in bed. But the real bonus it has, and this is more of a long-term benefit, is it prevents your mind from reinforcing this negative association between the bed and unpleasant wakefulness. Um, and a common symptom of that is feeling really sleepy before going to bed and then you get into bed and you just feel wide awake again. Um, or waking during the night, and suddenly feeling really awake, even after very little amount of sleep, you know, because your mind forms powerful associations. And if we repeatedly spend a lot of time in bed and it doesn't feel good to be in bed, our mind kind of learns the bed is not a good place to be. So as soon as we get into bed or as soon as we wake from sleep, the brain's like, uh oh, we got to activate all the fight or flight response to protect you from this evil bed. This bed is a horrible place to be. So the only way we can really break that association is by only being in bed when we're either asleep or when conditions feel right for sleep. And we do that by just getting out of bed whenever it's not good to be in bed. So even if you don't fall asleep that night, what you're doing is still going to be helpful. Uh, getting out of bed instead of staying in bed when being in bed doesn't feel good is still going to be helpful over the longer term too. Exactly. And that's something I, I noticed um, because sometimes if I would just, you know, try to go to, go to bed when this is all beginning, when this was all starting, I'd get anxious and be like, Oh no, I don't want to go to bed. I don't want to, you know what I mean? Cause I've had bad nights there and some nights it was sleeping on the couch for me that felt better. And I did notice that I was like, well, if I can sleep on the couch, why can't I sleep in the bed? Because I created that negative, those negative sleep thoughts. And then the, you know, arousal and, and all that, it just became uh, second nature. It just, without me being able to really control it, I, I had to do something about it. I, I feel like you're, from what I know, your mind will follow your body and vice versa. So um, just if I'm sleeping on the couch, I should be able to sleep in the bed, no problem. So I really just stopped using the couch for a place to sleep or whatever when I was having these difficult nights and retrained my brain to know the bed as a comfortable place to sleep, the right yeah. place to sleep. Um, I almost created like a, you know, it's 
what, what, what is the word for it? But it, it became like a haven, like a place where sleep happens and not a hangout. You know what I mean? The bedroom to me now, I don't go in there. I had a TV in there, um, you know, but we don't watch it anymore. So mm -hmm. like it's just the TV, it's not really, I'd rather be in the living room where I can watch television or relax and do all these things and then head to the bedroom. And I think coming into the living room has been great because it associates the living room with, you know, a place to be awake and a place to kind of relax. You know what I mean? Yeah. So going back to the bed after that reset, the bed feels like the proper place to sleep. Yeah, you you make a really good point there. Um, something I think people are going to identify with is I find I found that I was able to sleep on the couch. Um, why couldn't I sleep in bed? Um, and often it does come down to that conditioned arousal. You know, we've conditioned ourselves again through no fault of our own. It's just a fact that we've spent so much time in bed when being in bed didn't feel good. Our brain is telling us that it's got to protect us from being in bed. In order to do that, we have to be awake. Um, but if we are in a different environment, such as on the couch, we haven't got that association. So we're able to relax, we're able to feel feel sleepy, and we're able to, to fall asleep. And so if nothing else, the fact that we can fall asleep on the couch proves that we can sleep, as you just touched upon. Right. Um, and so how do we then make that transition? How do we shift that sleep from the couch to the bed? And I think it is a case of accepting that there's going to be some some sleep disruption in the short term um, by only allowing yourself to sleep in bed instead of the couch. But if you only allow yourself to sleep in your own bed, if that's your long-term goal is to sleep in your own bed, then by only allowing yourself to sleep in your own bed, that is where you will sooner or later sleep because sleep drive always wins in the end. Sleep always happens in the end. So if you refuse to allow yourself to sleep anywhere other than your own bed, that is where sleep is going to happen. And every minute of sleep you then get, you're going to be in your own bed. You're going to be reinforcing that more positive association between your bed and sleep instead of the couch or the guest room or, or anywhere else. Exactly. And that's just at this point now where I've done this so much, the, the bed is like, it's, I look at the bed differently now. Because when I started having these issues, I looked at the bed, like I said before, a negative place. I had so many bad experiences in there, not being able to sleep, having terrible days the day after. And it just snowballed into, I don't want to even go to in the bedroom anymore. I'll just stay on the couch and hopefully fall asleep. But once I retrained myself to sleep and you have to like retrain yourself to associate things, mm -hmm. um, you know, with sleep, the bed has become my natural place to sleep. It's the designated place to sleep and I, I no longer look at it with that negative outlook like I did before. And almost, it seems like these, these thoughts, and once you do that enough, these thoughts of these negative sleep thoughts, they start to fade and almost have less power, uh, which has been really cool. And I don't know if I'm jumping ahead again, Martin, but that was something that was very empowering was the fact that these negative sleep thoughts became less and less and less because I had so many good nights after these issues in my own bed. So now I'm having you know, maybe less sleep at first, but I'm having quality sleep. I'm actually tired. That sleep drive built up all day. And it was, it was awesome. It was such a great experience to just kind of come out of that. And I was like, Oh, finally, I'm able to kind of get a hold of myself again. And yeah. after having so much bad sleep, you know, and, and all these bad associations, it was, it was just reassuring that I was able to sleep again. And I guess I look back at a lot of the stuff that I was doing was I was, I was making it worse by, trying to go to bed earlier and staying in bed later. And before you know it, I was basically setting myself up for failure the next night because I just wasn't using any of the energy that I did have because I was so fatigued all the time or, you know, I thought I was sleep deprived, but I don't think I was ever really sleep deprived. I think a lot of it was just fatigued from the, the worry was doing more damage than the lack of sleep mm -hmm. at that point. So, yeah. yeah, you know, one thing um, that, I think is important to recognize too is just as it took time for maybe for our minds to associate the bed as not a nice place to be it's going to take time to kind of retrain our brains our minds to see the bed as a place for sleep and as a nice place to be um, so i think it can be helpful to emphasize that just because sometimes we can try these things you know for example we might decide okay i'm not going to allow myself to sleep on the couch um, i'm only going to sleep in my own bed and then after a week or two, you're not really finding you're making progress. Um, 
And really that's, that's understandable because just like it took time for the mind to associate the bed with unpleasant wakefulness, it's probably going to take a little bit of time for it to reassociate the bed with sleep and more pleasant wakefulness. So it is really a case of just trying to be as consistent as possible and really trying to take a, a long-term approach wherever possible. Right. And it's not an overnight fix. I mean, it's not mm-hmm. going to take one try at it. And, and that's why I really stuck to it. I, um, I wasn't successful right away. I had maybe like that first night I was tired from probably the night before. So I did get that six and a half hours of sleep. And I was like, Oh, that, that was great. That was quality. Um, but it's, it takes time. Cause then I, I did have some nights where I was still struggling and uh, it's, and still having the negative association and then still kind of worried. But like I said, over time I did get, you know, it, it did only take me about a few nights to start getting back on track. Mm-hmm. But in between there were some nights where I was, either it took me a while to fall asleep or I was up at a certain time. Um, but really it just, once you have those days where you, you, you're not sitting in bed, laying in bed, trying to catch up on sleep and all this other stuff and trying to take naps and all that, um, you're able to just really feel naturally tired and naturally sleepy at night. And, um, it, it just, it's really, you know, just going to keep trying at it and eventually it will work no yeah. matter what I, I think, unless there's, you know, something like a physical ailment or something like that. I mean, for me, this was anxiety based. So this was able to really, you know, really help that sleep restriction and being able to reset and using the CBTI techniques, you know, it was very helpful. So and I'm very glad I found, found those techniques through your videos. (laughs) You know, I want to kind of move on to, we've talked a lot about things that you were doing at night uh, to try and create better conditions for sleep it would be good for us to move on at some point to things we you may have done during the day to help improve your sleep. But before I do that, I just want to check, was there anything else that you can think of that um, you found helpful in the evenings or at nighttime uh, to create those better conditions for sleep? Uh, you really, for me, what worked for me is, is just having time to relax. You know, mm. um, I actually, what I do is now is um, if I, I've had a really busy day because sometimes I feel like my more busy days, it's harder to kind of come down and relax because I've had so much going on. Um, that's just for me, at least what, what I do now is I'll have a designated hour before bedtime where I relax. I can do mm-hmm. some meditation, some breathing techniques, some reading, whatever it may be. It's actually, you know, very similar to the stuff that I would do when I'd reset in the middle of the night, if I had to go, you know, get out of bed for 20, 20 minutes or so. But now I, I really focus on mindfulness trying to um, really just get the brain to slow down, the mind to slow down, because, you know, if you're overactive in your mind and you're trying to sleep, um, it's just going to take longer. I mean, eventually sleep drive will kick in and you will fall asleep. But this is something that has really been helping me out is just meditation, mindfulness, um, relaxation an hour before bed, instead of, you know, doing, doing work or whatever, having, um, you know, something that's very exciting happening. uh, It's just, it's nicer to just kind of come down before bed. And I've allotted myself an hour to do so every night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that can be really helpful, just giving ourselves that time to unwind. And it's important to emphasize that we're not using that hour to try and generate sleep or generate sleepiness. It's just some time for us to relax and unwind. And it can also be helpful to just make, because it helps make that period before we would normally go to bed maybe a time that we would look forward to rather than the time that we kind of fear or dread. So if we reserve that hour before bed, for example, for just like it's me time, it's just, I'm just going to do things that I find relaxing. I find enjoyable. I'm not going to do any work, no chores, just good stuff. That, that period before going to bed can then become a time that we might start to look forward to, which in itself could just be a transformation in our way of thinking of the approach of bedtime And it also just helps ensure that we're creating better conditions for sleep just because we're going to be in a more relaxed state. You know, that arousal is perhaps going to be lower. Um, If we're doing things we enjoy, it can also maybe even just serve as a distraction. Um, And it helps us recognize sleepiness cues. You know, if we're not wired in that hour before bed, we're more likely to recognize when we are feeling sleepy instead of fatigued and tired. So we might then be more likely to go to bed when conditions are much better for sleep. Oh, exactly. And I do want to bring up one point, Martin. Um, an issue that did come up 
that I did re realize. So once I got my sleep back on track, I felt like, you know, doing the sleep restriction and all that, um, which is extremely helpful. When I kind of got almost too confident, I started to kind of drift away a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and what would happen was I would get like goal too goal oriented before bed with certain things. And this happened, you know, here and there, mm -hmm. uh, not, not every night, but uh, it could be that one night where I'm really thinking about something about, you know, whether it be work or something, an event coming up or whatever it may be. Uh, those goal oriented thoughts will keep you awake. At least it does for me. So it is good to, to have that relaxation time, that you time, but kind of maybe stay away from the goal oriented stuff and just mm -hmm. do the relaxing things you enjoy doing. So that's, that's just one point that, that did come up because there was a couple nights actually, yeah, there's, there was a couple nights where it was, I had something on my mind and that kept me up. And then the next day I was kind of like, Oh no, am I back? Am I relapsing or is this mm -hmm. happening? But, um, but no, I just implemented the techniques again and was able to kind of get through that. Yeah. But um, definitely having that relaxation time before bed and doing relaxing things is, is key to really help you kind of, like you said, look forward to going, you know, transitioning into night and going to sleep. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, unless you have anything else to add in terms of the nighttime side of the equation, maybe now would be a good time to move on to the day um, because oh, so yes. much <laughs> of our sleep is actually influenced by what we do during the day um, rather than by what we do it do during the night. Um, so I thought that would be good to touch upon. So on reflection, what kind of changes do you feel you made to what you do during the day that, perhaps helped you improve your sleep at night. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because this was very important and um, this really helped turn my bad sleep around and get back to normal, better sleep. Um, throughout the day before, when I was first going through all these sleep problems and like I said, I'd never gone through anything like this before. Um, I was so hyper-focused on it all day. Mm -hmm. And this was it became that vicious cycle of I'm worried. Am I going to get a good night's sleep from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed, I was worried. And this lasted for months and it, until I was able to implement um, CBTI techniques. But now what I do is, is I try to you know wake up with a positive, optimistic mindset, try to have the best day I can have. Um, I exercise more now. Um, I know it's, it's winter where I am. It's, it's cold in this time of year. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, I'd go on my, my, I have a, a exercise bike at home that I'd go on and do that, do some cardiovascular stuff. Um, and then I'd go do work. So like in the morning, I'd wake up, do some exercise, go to work, um, try to socialize as much as I could with people, mm -hmm. uh, um, do things that I, you know, I, I typically would avoid when I was going through the worst of my insomnia, I would avoid going out. And that was, that was huge avoidance. That was a way to cope, I guess, to kind of, you know, Oh, I'm too fatigued to go out and too tired to do this. But um, I basically had to like kind of, you know, push myself and mm -hmm. start doing my normal activities as, as much, you know, normal as I, I can make it because we're still going through COVID mm -hmm. and things are still kind of restricted, but um, there's definitely that light at the end of the tunnel. But anyways, it's just um, keeping busy, keeping up with friends, family, uh, just anything you can do to really just keep your mind off of all the sleeping. Cause when you think about it all day, you're basically setting yourself up for a anxious night. Um, but yeah, those are things that I do now. I go out, I have things to look forward to. I make plans. Um, at first, when I was first going through this, I was afraid to make plans for the next day or in a, a few days because I'd be afraid. Oh, what if I have a bad night? I won't be able to perform and go do what I need to do yeah. or spend time with people I want to spend time with. But once I started to, and even if I did have a bad night, start going out and start, you know, making plans again and doing things. Um, I started feeling more confident as well as like almost looking at sleep as it's, it's good for you. It's, it's important, but it's not as important as I thought it was. Mm. It's not going to keep me from doing the things I love doing. And that was, it, it was getting to the point where I was so sick of just, you know, worrying and worrying and worrying and, and, and Googling things and watching all these videos and stuff. No offense to your videos. Cause those, those are very <laughs> helpful, but um you know, it was, it was like that consumed so much of my time before yeah. that I brought it to bed with me every night and I worried. And then it just, the, the worry was more powerful than having a bad night's sleep and means of mm -hmm. being fatigued and not feeling well the next day. I, I feel like I've come to learn. Um, but yeah, that's just, it's important to keep up and do the things that you love doing and, and not, 
let this consume your life. I mean, there's so many people that go through sleep issues or insomnia. And um, like I said, I felt very desperate at times for help. And uh, I didn't know what to do at first. I didn't know if I needed to go to the doctor or, you know, um, beyond sleeping pills or supplements or whatever. Uh, I was very hesitant. So I didn't do that. I didn't want to become like, addicted to sleeping pills. And um, sometimes they can give you sleep, but not, you know, like you've said in some of your videos, it, it, it makes it uh, easier for to turn on that nervous system and fall asleep because it doesn't generate sleep. Yeah. Uh, those, those medications just kind of help with all the anxiety and stuff like that. Cause sleep is just a natural biological process. Yeah. Um, so I hopefully I didn't go too far off topic on that, but no, I think, I think that was all really, really helpful stuff. You know, I think it's so important to be as active and engaged as possible during the day and independently of sleep, you know, not to allow sleep to control what we might do during the day. Um, and it, there's so, for so many reasons, um, if nothing else, because one of our biggest thoughts that can keep us awake at night is concern about what the next day will be like if we don't fall asleep or if we don't get a certain amount of sleep. Um, so if we can just explore that belief by seeing what we are capable of doing during the day, even after difficult nights of sleep, we might surprise ourselves. We might recognize that perhaps we do have some control over the quality of our day than how we sleep the previous night. Um, I think we do have more control over the quality of our day, how we feel during the day than sleep alone. Um, if we do things that we enjoy during the day, even after difficult nights, by the very nature, because we're doing enjoyable activities, we're going to get some sense of enjoyment out of that activity. But it can be difficult because our minds can be screaming at us to conserve energy, to not do anything, to cancel all of our plans because we are just not capable. Our brain wants to trick us into telling us we're not capable after difficult nights of sleep or after no sleep. And this can perpetuate the problem because then we're kind of, we're often canceling plans that we might have otherwise enjoyed. So we're guaranteeing that a difficult night leads to a difficult day or a less pleasant day. And then because we're less active, we're not really doing stuff. Then our mind has got all this free time on its hands exactly. and it's going to want to worry. It's going to want to generate anxiety. We might then want to try doing things like napping, which is going to reduce that sleep drive. If we nap, if, if we can't nap, then we worry even more because we can't nap. So doing good stuff during the day can really help break that connection between sleep, quality of sleep and quality of our days. And when we can start to recognize that we do have a lot of control over how we feel during the day. This is not to say that sleep has no influence. It definitely does, but we do have a lot of control over how we feel during the day. If we can break that connection between a hundred percent of my day is predetermined by how I sleep a hundred percent of the time, we might then start to put a little bit, little, little bit less pressure on ourselves to sleep. You know, that thought that I must fall back to sleep, I must get a certain amount of sleep, otherwise today will be awful. We kind of chip away at the anxiety that kind of thinking can generate. So in turn, we start to enjoy better days. And because we're a little bit less worried about sleep, we can start to enjoy better nights too. Oh, exactly. And this is one thing that I, I did, um, I heard somewhere, I can't remember now, I don't know if it was a quote, but it was, uh, don't live to sleep, sleep to live. And I'm not sure where that, I, I came across that when I was doing some research or whatever, but that really stuck with me because, you know, you should be enjoying your life. You shouldn't let, you know, a bad night's sleep really ruin the whole next day because it, it, you might be a little tired, fatigued or whatever, but you can still get through the day. And that's something I noticed you know, you can really get through the day and still have an enjoyable day, even if it's going to walking out, going to the park and then just yeah. being out in the sunshine and enjoying the sound of the birds chirping or whatever. It's honestly much better than sitting at home on your couch and just wallowing and worrying. And yeah. it's because I, I feel like for me, at least the worry was doing much more damage than the lack of sleep. And, and then regardless in the end your body always does generate that sleep that you need yeah. so um and if anything you do get that minimum amount of sleep that your body will will need to get through the next day so yeah. it, it's just 
I don't know, throughout this whole process, um, I don't think it didn't happen, you know, it, it, everything happens for a reason, I believe. You know, I'm very optimistic and I believe in, in things like that happening. Um, I think that for me, this was, I wasn't paying attention to myself. I wasn't taking care of myself enough mentally and physically. And um, this was kind of a, like a wake up call, in, in, if anything, literally, because I was awake all the time. But anyways, it was, uh, you know, quite, quite the experience. And at first it was very, very scary, but in time, you know, and using the CBTI techniques, um, you know, you, you, you'll get that confidence again. So it's, yeah. it's been great. Yeah. I, I, I think that just doing anything during the day, anything you can add to your day, even if it's just something small, um, like a walk around the block um, or walking out to, to the coffee shop or anything that we can add to our day that we might otherwise have avoided um, based on how we sleep is helpful. You know, we don't have to be out training for a marathon. Um, just any kind of activity or anything we enjoy. These things don't even have to all be physical, just things that we are passionate about that motivate us, that give us a sense of enrichment or enjoyment. These are all great things we can add to our lives. And if we do it independently of sleep, you know, there's never a negative outcome because we're going to have better days and we're going to maybe put less pressure on ourselves to sleep. So we might have better nights in, in response too. And I think something you touched upon with that quote as well is, you know, when we're, when we're, when we're all on our deathbeds, hopefully a long, long time from now, we're not really going to look back on our lives and think, you know, February 3rd, 1996 was a great night of sleep that gave my life all of its meaning <laughs> instead we're going to remembering all the things we did when we were awake that added enrichment and joy to our lives and this shows us that really what happens during the day is far more important than what happens at night so perhaps if we can focus our attention and our efforts on living our daytime life independently of sleep then perhaps sleep will take care of itself because we're then not giving it the attention or putting the effort into sleep. The two, the two things that can make sleep much more difficult. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's just what you do during the day is just so important. So if you just waste away and, you know, waste your day and not do anything, um, you're going to continue to have the problems. So like just for anyone listening, it, it is good to, to get out and, stay busy and do things that you, you really enjoy doing. And like you said, Martin, even walking around the block that can make a world of difference for the next you know, night, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. So what's an average night like for you these days, Jake? I'm, I'm guessing you're probably not tracking your sleep that much these days no. compared to when you were struggling, but you know, yeah. just, just on reflection, how would you describe an average night? Well, an average night now, I, like I said, I don't really think too much about it. The only thing I really implement now, um, would be that relaxation time at the end of each day. If I don't do that, then I kind of set myself up for a little bit, you know, harder time yeah. falling asleep. Um, I don't think about it as much at all, really. Um, I don't talk, you know, I used to, this is something I used to talk to like my fiance about all the time or my, my mom, I'm very close to my mom. So I'll, I'd call her and be like, Oh, I didn't sleep good last night. Or she'd ask me how I was doing or how I've been sleeping. But this is something that's just really kind of, it's kind of irrelevant now. It's something I don't really worry about. Um, so talking about it less and less, thinking about it less and less. Um, I'm, I'm now sleeping. Like I think last night I slept eight and a half hours, mm -hmm. which is, that was wow. pretty awesome. And this is coming from someone who was going through night after night of just terrible, poor quality, you know, anxiety ridden sleep. Yeah. But yeah, I slept really good last night. And then maybe the night before that I slept probably seven and that's all I want. My, my goal is to just kind of get back to seven to eight hours and, and I'm, I'm back doing that. So yeah. Uh, I'm thinking less and less about it. I'm worried about it, you know, less and less. If I talked to you about maybe a month ago, I'd probably still be very anxiety ridden. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm just, I'm doing pretty good. I, I, I feel good. And my sleep is basically back on track. I'd say 99%, you know, because yeah. you're not, you're not always going to have a perfect night and I don't expect uh, to always have a perfect night. So. Yeah. I think it's that shift in the mindset, you know, which is really the, the key, the key evidence of success um, because when, when, when we, when we don't really worry about sleep, we're not really paying attention to sleep. That's typically when we're sleeping the best. So if some, if you just ask an average person on the street, Oh, how many hours of sleep did you get last night? 
they're they're just going to kind of guess you know they'll they'll yeah. think about it for a few seconds when did <laughs> i go to bed when did i get out of bed and just fill that entire period with sleep but when we have insomnia when we're struggling you know we kind of know everything about our sleep almost down to the minute you know we're oh, really sure. <laughs> analytical we're really monitoring and perhaps we can use that if we can recognize that there has been this difference maybe we can use that as evidence that paying so much attention to sleep and really monitoring for sleep maybe isn't that helpful maybe if no. we can just take an approach of you know sleep is going to happen accepting each night for what it is shifting our attention to what we do during the day um, and just allowing sleep to come naturally because sleep does want to come naturally it's only when we kind of crave it when we strive for it that it tends to be a bit more elusive um, that that can be so helpful for sure so it's it really is like that you know it will happen. It will happen. And that's what I really got out of like, you know, sleep restriction. Like I said, it was the biggest technique that worked for me. It really did. And once I had a few nights of good quality, six, six and a half hours of sleep, that was, that was better than the nine hours laying in bed, getting four yeah. or five hours of broken sleep or whatever. So um, yeah, in time, you just, you, I feel like I've reset, but it's, you know, you gotta, you gotta work at it. It didn't come didn't come free. It came with, with, uh, yeah. having to implement techniques and, and, um, but now it's, yeah, just, I don't think about it, you know, barely. <laughs> so yeah. it's really, it's a freeing, very good feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jake, I really appreciate all the time that you've given up to come onto the podcast. I just know that many, many people listening to this are going to get a lot of value from it and it's going to prove to be really helpful. But there is one last question that I haven't asked you yet. And it's a question that I ask everyone that comes on. So I would like to ask you too. Um, and it's this, if someone with chronic insomnia is listening and feels as though they've tried everything, that they're beyond help and they can't do anything to improve their sleep, what would you tell them? I'd say don't give up on yourself um, and don't really just don't feed into the, the negative sleep thoughts, try to turn those negative thoughts into positive thoughts. Um, really, really try to implement. I know it sounds scary, but try the, the sleep restriction. Um, try to reset as well. If you can't fall asleep, get out of bed, uh, do something relaxing for about 20, 20, 30 minutes and try again. Cause you'll be successful. Uh, eventually it's, you know, if you have to do it multiple times, you have to do it multiple times, but don't give up on yourself. Don't feed into those negative sleep thoughts, turn those sleep thoughts, those negative sleep thoughts into positive sleep thoughts. And eventually you will reset. You will feel better. Get out, live your life. Don't wallow. And, and I mean, I know it's, it's easier said than done, but I struggled for a while with this and I I'm someone that would never have struggled with this. I, I don't think, but yeah. Um, with everything happening in the world, uh, I, I did get very stressed out and very anxious about a lot of things. But uh, in the end, uh, just don't don't give up in yeah. in time. If it takes you five weeks, or if it takes you six months to to have the sleep restriction work, it will work, and yeah. you'll have that confidence back. That's I think that's really all I, I, I gotta say. So that's great. Just because I know people are gonna be uh, thinking this. Do you have any tips on how you might turn those negative sleep thoughts into more, more positive ways of thinking? Well, for me, at least um, having a positive day, you know what I mean? Trying to mm -hmm. turn um, almost like I had to rewire my brain, it felt like. But if I went out and I had a positive day, um, you know, smile, smile more, you know, try to just get out, enjoy, enjoy time with, uh, like I said, friends, friends, family, um, yeah, it's just the more positive things that you do uh, or just, you know, getting out of bed and getting, getting off the couch or whatever and getting out into life, um, the, my, mind, my mindset and my thought process became more positive in general. Yeah. And I was able to think, you know what, instead of having a bad night tonight and worrying about it, I was like, you know what, I'm going to sleep good. And even telling myself, I'm going to have a good night's sleep tonight worked. Yeah. So it was very yeah. helpful. That's great. So I think like one thought that you can have, which maybe you would, consider one of your negative sleep thoughts would be something maybe you know oh, if, if I don't sleep tonight tomorrow will be awful and so you've kind of identified that as a thought that is a challenge for you so then you've put some effort into making the next days better independently of how you sleep and then through your own experience maybe you've been able to turn that thought on its head to one like 
if I don't sleep well tonight, I know that there are things I can do to feel better during the day tomorrow. That's just off the top of my head. Yeah. Is that is that the kind of thing that you're getting at? Like the way you yeah. can just kind of transform your your way of thinking around sleep? Yeah, yeah. That's basically. I mean, no matter what, like, um, because for me, if I if I didn't do anything and I sat around and I felt bad for myself all day, those thoughts would continue to you know yeah. I'd be in this like rabbit hole of negative thinking about it, and it just you know even if you just go out like you said, do something, take a walk, go around the block. It, it just even something so simple like that, it's gonna really change your mindset even if you know it's it's it doesn't sound like it, it might not work as well but if you get out and just try it you'll notice a difference it really works yeah, so absolutely all right great jake well thank you so much for coming onto the podcast again i really appreciate you uh giving up the time out for your day um i think we covered lots of great points and i think it's gonna help lots and lots of people everything that we've discussed so thank you oh thank you for having me martin thank you Thanks for listening to the Insomnia Coach podcast. If you're ready to implement evidence-based cognitive and behavioral techniques to improve your sleep, but think you might need some additional support and guidance, I would love to help. There are two ways we can work together. First, you can get my online coaching course. This is the most popular option. My course combines sleep education with individualized coaching and is guaranteed to improve your sleep. You will learn new ways of thinking about sleep and implement better sleep habits over a period of eight weeks. This gives you time to build sleep confidence and notice results without feeling overwhelmed. You can get the course and start right now at insomniacoach.com forward slash online. I also offer a phone coaching package where we start with a one hour call. This can be voice only or video, your choice and we come up with an initial two-week plan that will have you implementing cognitive and behavioral techniques that will lead to long-term improvements in your sleep. You get unlimited email-based support and guidance for two weeks after the call, along with a half-hour follow-up call at the end of the two weeks. You can book the phone coaching package at insomniacoach.com forward slash phone. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Insomnia Coach podcast. I'm Martin Reed, and as always, I'd like to leave you with this important reminder. You can sleep.